The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared with them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1966, a voter registration card arrived in the mail for Vernon Dahmer. Dahmer was an African-American man living in Mississippi, and 1966 was the first year he could freely vote. He had tried to register way back in 1949, but that attempt was denied. He spent much of his life participating in voter registration drives and was twice elected president of his county's NAACP. And so the day the voter registration card arrived should have been a day of celebration, but it wasn't because Vernon Dahmer had died a few weeks earlier of injuries suffered at the hands of the KKK. Of course, the work that Vernon Dahmer had done was not in vain, as voting became possible for thousands of others. But even that wasn't the end of the story. On his memorial is written his mantra, if you don't vote, you don't count. 32 years later, Ellie Dahmer, Vernon's widow, attended the trial of one of the men who had attacked her family. Another of the attackers testified at that trial, and on his way out of the courtroom that day, he stopped to apologize to Ellie and to ask for her forgiveness. That man, Billy Roy Pitts, had experienced a major change, a transformation of his life. In our Gospel lesson, Peter, James, and John climb the mountain with Jesus. His clothes become dazzling white, and his beautiful brown skin shone in the light. Moses appears there on that mountaintop. The disciples would remember stories of Moses having power over the sea. They would remember stories of Moses feeding the multitudes with manna. Elijah is also there. The disciples would remember stories of him cleansing lepers and raising the dead. The experience was transforming for them. Transformation and transfiguration are both words that describe change. The appearance of Jesus changed. His disciples were also changed. Transfiguration is the weekend before Ash Wednesday in most Protestant churches. Our Catholic and Orthodox siblings continue to celebrate the Feast of Transfiguration on its original date in August. Transfiguration marks a turning point in the transformation of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. In the next weeks, they would walk with Jesus on his journey toward Jerusalem on his journey toward the cross. As they would travel, they would better understand the peril that they would soon face. Tradition tells us that most of them would also be crucified. 
It's important to remember that the disciples didn't suddenly understand everything as they descended that mountain with Jesus. Mark tells us that they continued to ask him questions, but the nature of those questions changed. They acknowledged Christ's identity as the Messiah. The disciples had been transformed by their experience, but they still weren't perfect. Later in Mark's Gospel, we read that James and John asked to sit at his left and right hand in heaven, and they all fall asleep in the garden as Jesus prays. And Peter fearfully denies knowing Jesus. When I traveled with an ecumenical group to Transfiguration Mountain in Israel a decade ago, each of us was given time to think about what we would have felt and said and done if we had been with Jesus that day. I concluded that I would have been a flibberty gibbet, speaking in sentence fragments punctuated with exclamation points, which is about what Peter did when he said, let us build three tents. And even though, like the disciples, I wouldn't have come close to understanding what was happening, I would not want the experience to end. That's why I would have been confused and angry when on the way down the mountain, Jesus says, don't tell anyone until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. That statement would lead me to a thousand more questions none of which could be answered to my satisfaction at that time. Pastor Patricia Robbie challenges us to take yet another step in our understanding of this story. She writes, Maybe you have noticed this thing, that when news is hard, so is listening. This happens in doctor's offices and emergency rooms and when the police come to the door, when you are having a conversation and they are telling you something you don't necessarily want to hear, a situation you don't want to be in. Have you noticed how hard it is to take in what they are saying? The disciples pushed back hard at Jesus' announcement of the coming crucifixion. It was news they did not want to hear. It didn't fit in with their plans any more than a tough diagnosis or dreadful news or words of rejection fit into our plans. And so Jesus took three, just three disciples with him, where a message from the cloud with other senses dulled, if not removed, provides them with the powerful instruction, the command they cannot help hearing. Listen. The voice from heaven identifies Jesus and then tells them what to do. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. When news is difficult, when it's hard to listen, but listening is so important, especially through the difficult times, remember these words. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, listening can be of greater service than speaking. And I am often reminded that I have two ears and one mouth, and there's a reason for that. As we enter into our Lenten journey, perhaps all of us need to be reminded that we have two ears and one mouth. Hold on to this word from God in this passage as we enter into those 40 days. This is God's Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Amen.